Okay, first of all, welcome everyone who's on, and um, thank you, Amitaz, again for this opportunity. Um, maybe you could start, like you've done some other weeks, just a few minutes, um, giving us here in, uh, in America um, a little bit of perspective on this uh, riots and everything. Like, is there something you would share with us about this? I don't really have much to say. I mean, I'm not up to date with exact details. I think uh, the perception is that the, um, there have been a number of incidents over the last period of time where police uh, seem to have overreacted or acted in unprofessional fashion. Um, whether it's been with black people or I remember one incident where even a woman, harmless woman, got shot because a policeman, you know, panicked. Um, that's not, you know, it's very hard for people outside America to relate to that sort of thing. You have to remember in England, the police not even, don't even have weapons. You know, the police don't carry guns. So the American culture of guns and violence and uh, uh, violent response, very hard for people outside the United States to, to relate to that. Um, we, we, we expect much more controlled conduct. Um, even if a policeman has to endanger himself uh, to make a clear judgment before using lethal force, you know, that's something that, that in outside the United States that's expected. Um, I, I don't think it's really for me to comment on American culture. I think you can well understand the anger and frustration of people when they see the events the way they purported to be. Um, and I, I think you can understand the racial element to it as well. From a Jewish point of view, of course, if expressing anger and strong political sentiment has got nothing to do with looting and stealing. I mean, that's just, uh, that's just using an opportunity in an illegitimate fashion. But I think you probably do better if you ask me other questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll start with a question, um, and just the, this, the format we do over here is we'll, we try to like focus like about five minutes uh, per question. Um, and also, I just want to mention to anyone: if you have questions, um, please feel free to. I'm, I'm just going to name myself here better. Um, so I'm Rabbi Rutenberg here on the list, um, and you can private message me uh, questions, and we'll try to um, address them to to Rabbi Tatz. Um, so, how would you define um, Kabbalah? What is Kabbalah? Okay, first of all, let me thank Rabbi Rittenberg for this uh, final session of our five sessions. I actually wanted to do 50 sessions, but he limited me to five. So, unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to stop. Um, the, uh, but it's been a great opportunity and uh, five minute quick answers to questions. Interesting format. But anyway, everyone should support Emmet, wonderful groundbreaking institution in the uh, New York area. Um, Kabbalah. Kabbalah means received tradition. It is, although it is logical and has its own inner structure, nevertheless, it's received from a higher world. Kabbalah is the mystical, mysterious dimension of Torah, the hidden aspect of Torah. And of course, much too much to say about it in five minutes. I'll just say one idea, one brief idea. We call it Sod. The technical word we use for Kabbalah is Sod. Sod means secret. And the basic idea here, the reason we call it secret, is not because you don't happen to know. A secret is not defined as something you don't know. A real secret is something that you could not know. In other words, it's not because no one told you, it's because no one could tell you. Sod is material that is living in a world beyond words. Let me put it to you this way. The Gemara says in Masech the Chagiga, the Gemara says that when the rabbi teaches the student Kabbalah, the teacher is not allowed to teach the subject, only give hints. Or as it's put there, Roshay Prakim, which means sort of, I don't know, headings or main categories. So some people think it's some sort of a game. You know, you've got to say, he's got to guess. That's not the idea. The idea is that the teacher cannot say these things. There are no words for these things. These things are live in inner knowledge, way beyond the words. The words are necessary in order to in order to uh, form just a direction for the student to take. But the wisdom goes, goes far beyond words. And therefore, the brief answer is Kabbalah is the hidden tradition, deep inner aspect of Torah that's been handed down together with the Torah, never written down, and comes to be written and revealed paradoxically in the opposite way to Torah. Let me leave you with this thought. Jerry just held up a copy of my book, very pleased to see that he's, that he's got it. That book, which is called, there you go, there you guys, dawn ends the night. One of the main themes in that book 
is that Torah gets revealed less and less as time goes by. The world darkens and gets hidden. But paradoxically, Kabbalah gets more and more revealed. So as the world darkens, the light of Kabbalah ascends. When it ascends fully and bursts into the world, that's called Moshiach. So paradoxically, over time, although most of Torah has been lost as we move through time, Kabbalah gets revealed more and more as time goes on. Let me greet Rabbi Khan, whom I see is driving someplace in the United States. Um, my guess is he's either going out to a rugby match or to windsurf probably on the lake. I don't know where he's going. Anyway, it's nice to see him and, uh, and have him participate. Uh, Rabbi Rudmog, I have two questions on my screen. Can I give your permission to answer them? Of course. Okay, so the first one is a woman's voice. That's called Isha. So there's a, an issue uh, limiting a man listening to a woman sing. Not a voice, it's a singing voice. And why is this a, um, the question is, why is this an intimate, an intimate revelation? The answer is, I mean, there are many components to the question. One question, obviously, is why is it women who are expected to be modest and cover their, their depth in a certain way more than men? That's one element of the question. But let me deal with the, with the immediate question, which is, what is there about a voice that is intimate? You know, if you, if you know anything about music and the power of the human voice, and you hear a woman sing when it's well done. I'm talking about noise. I'm not talking about modern rock music and uh, inane words. I'm talking about something very, very soulful. There's no question that the personality comes through in the singing voice. It comes through in the voice altogether. But music, which is a carrier wave of the soul, is a very deep uh, revelation of what is inward. And the whole concept of a woman's modesty is not to reveal the inner dimension too explicitly in the outer world. You have another example is a married woman should not be revealing her hair. Now, there's nothing erotic or naked about hair, right? It's a spiritual revelation. The hair of the head is not like an uncovered part of the body. If it were, of course, then even unmarried girls would be required to cover their, to cover their hair. The point about the, the hair is that it's a spiritual, it's, it's a spiritual error. In other words, it's a why the hair reveals something very deep will take us deep into Kabbalistic discussion of the aura and the light that surrounds the body. But the voice, the simple answer to the question is, the voice is a very deep revelation of what you are. And singing, especially singing with talent, where their personality is in the song, that is an extremely potent revelation, right, of, uh, of something very deep. And that why, that's why it falls into the category of modesty. Uh, on a related question, I have a question here. Where can we find the laws of Tzniut? In other words, the laws governing a woman's modest presentation. There are many, many works on that. You can find many books. Probably the best known is about Falk's book. And I think it's called, maybe it's called Crown of Modesty, something like that. I'll just point out to you that although that book is comprehensive, it goes through dress and uh, a lot of details. I'll just point out to you, it is a stringent book. So I'm not sure, you know, it has to be not, not for everyone who's a beginner necessarily. You know, you have to know realistically who you are and where, where you're beginning and make small and meaningful steps. But that is an encyclopedic book looking at the technical halachot of modesty, and I'm sure your local rabbi can steer you in the direction of many more. Right, Rabbi Rittenberg, next question. Okay, so I have a question here. Um, hi, Rabbi Tatz. I hope you are well. I greatly enjoy reading your books and listening to your shirim. Recently, the following question has been on my mind, and I would greatly appreciate your perspective. I understand that Hashem interacts with us in a highly individualized manner, and that all that He does is for our ultimate good. However, at the same time, it seems that there are moments like when there is a plague, perhaps like the current corona crisis, when Hashem decrees something on the community. In such situations, it seems that someone might get afflicted due to him or her being collateral damage, quotations, and not because he or she is indeed deserving of this. This seems a contradiction to the earlier mentioned idea that Hashem interacts with us in a individualized and purely beneficial way for each and every one of us. When connected to Hashem in the current situation, how can one feel that Hashem is looking out special for him and all done is in his best interest. I would really appreciate to hear your thoughts on this matter. Okay, this is a very difficult question. First of all, greetings, Daniel. I notice you're late, but I'm glad to have you with me. Okay, um, how's your baby? Good? Good. Okay. Uh, this is a hard question. So let me say, first of all, the principle. What's being referred to, what's being referred to is a... Um, principle that the Gemara teaches that when a destruction is released on the community, the language in the Talmud is when the destroyer is given permission to 
to destroy in a plague type situation, then there's no discerning between the good and the bad, those who deserve and those who don't deserve. Let me, ha let me hasten to tell you, this is not a question of God being unfair or uh, incapable of targeting the bullets accurately. This is a question of revelation. Let, let's be clear about this. There are times when we don't deserve a vision. That means a clarity of Hashem relating to each individual specifically according to what that person deserves. And at such times when a community is given a message, and the message to the community is you're not on a good enough level, one of the pain, one of the aspects of suffering is that there's no apparent discerning. It seems meaningless. Let me put it to you that way. It seems unfair and it seems meaningless. Inwardly, everybody gets exactly what they need. Make no mistake. Inwardly, that's always happening. But at times of crisis that affect the community, it's less, it's less visible. Let me give you another example of this. There's a thing called ashkacha pratit. That means an individual getting dealt with exactly according to what they deserve. Everybody gets exactly what they need. God is interacting with every blade of grass, let alone every human being. But some it's more revealed and some it's less revealed. The people on the highest spiritual level, Hashem's interaction with them is clearly revealed. They know it, they see it, they see the response to their tefillot. They know it exactly and it's visible. There's people on a lower level who don't live on that level. They don't relate to God as if he's relating to them. They believe that they're vulnerable to statistics. Such people get dealt with in a way that looks statistical. Okay, this is, it's a very scary thought, but that's when the community gets afflicted in such a way, God can hide himself in a way that appears that he's not dealing with each individual. Does it have a lucky practical output? Yes. For example, choose good company. Choose good company. There are times when you might get dealt with in a way that looks as if you got swept away because you're in bad company. That's the way it looks. And the world manifests that way. And it has practical relevance. Hang out in good company. If you're in a place where people might deserve to be punished as a group, you're in danger. The halachic phrase for that is Euler Russia, Euler Shchenoi. When things go bad for a certain person, then people who are nearby might get involved. Obviously, one of the reasons is if you're nearby, you might get influenced. Right? The, the Bnei Ruven and the Bnei Shimon were neighbors. When the Korach revolt happened, the neighbors were affected too. One of the reasons is you get influenced by bad neighbors. But there's also a sense in which you get swept along. But let me assure your questioner, right, that God is always interacting with the world, but there are times when he does it in a more revealed fashion. That's a great privilege and a pleasure. And there are times when he's more hidden. I'll give you a final example. When something happens to you as an individual, we don't know why things happen. We don't know. When you live in a prophetic era, you go to the prophet, you know exactly why this illness occurred and this event occurred and that event occurred. Today, we don't know. There are rare exceptions. Sometimes a person does something and you see the response exactly and specifically. That's a tremendous privilege. It's a very unusual occurrence, like a flash of lightning in a dark night, and you should take the message. But most times, we don't know. And therefore, the Talmud says when stuff happens to you, you ask which layer of your life needs improving. You go through all the areas of your life. You make improvements. If you remind me at some point, stay in touch with me. Imit Hashem, soon I'll give a class on why things happen. Based on a text, if, you want, if you'd like to look it up, you can look up the text beforehand. It's a section in the Mesilat, in the um, Derech Hashem. In Derech Hashem, the Ramchal, I see Jerry's reaching for his book, so I'll give you the exact reference. For those of you who like to look it up, in the Derech Hashem, in the uh, second section, the third chapter, that's Chelek Bet, Chelek Sheni, that's the second chapter, you can, second section, write it down, and it's in the third chapter, and it's in the subsection 11 to 12. Okay, I'll hold it up for you, you can see the reference, see that? You can write that down. Now, this is a very good edition, by the way, this one has good English translation, and very excellent notes at the back by Rabbi Arya Kaplan. Now, in that section that I quoted in Derech Hashem, Ram Chalt says something astounding, astounding. He says that there are 12 reasons why things happen in the world. Imagine knowing Torah so thoroughly that you can actually make a categorical statement. There are 12 and only 12. Believe me, the Torah doesn't say anywhere a list of 12. The Ramchal has pulled these together from his entire knowledge of the whole Torah. And he can, is capable of making a statement. There are only 12 reasons. When something happens to you, it's one of 12 reasons. Reward and punishment is only one of them. And in this incredible section, he goes through specifically each of the 12 reasons of why things might happen in the world. 
that doesn't mean you're always able to identify which particular one it is in your case. Again, Hashem is hidden in the world. But that is a, that's a fantastic discussion. And Imit Hashem, if you stay in touch with me, I will send you a recording when I get around to doing it. I haven't, I haven't actually prepared a, a class on that, but it's going to be based on this particular source and you can read it up in the meantime. Yeah, good. Uh, Daniel, great. Where is it? Here. It is in the second section. Okay, part two. Chapter three. Siman Yud Aleph Yud Bet. Look, Daniel, here you can see it written out if you want to see it. Oh, in your, in your book, which page is it? So I'll give you a page number in that book. Page 108. Uh, in this particular edition is where it begins. Yeah, okay, next question. Hi, Rabbi. Um, I, oh, actually, no. If Torah learning is supposed to change a person and develop their midot, their character traits, why do we find so many people who devote their lives to Torah yet do not have good character traits? Well, the answer to that is they're not really devoting themselves to Torah. And devoting yourself to Torah means building your character. So I would say it like this. There are people who devote themselves to some aspects of Torah, but not to others. Right? In other words, Torah involves two tracks, many tracks. But one of those tracks is academic learning, knowing the Torah sources, knowing the material. Another track is halachic, knowing what to do. But there's another major track. It's called Musar. Musar means working on yourself, using Torah that you learn to change your personality. The Gaon of Vilna says that the ultimate purpose of learning Torah is to change your character. So anybody who studies Torah and does not let it uh, permeate their character has got it desperately wrong, desperately wrong. That's like a person going to a concert and when the orchestra starts playing, the band starts playing, they pay attention to the, the outfits that the performers are wearing and the materials that the instruments are made of, you know, and the decor in the hall. They're missing the point. There's music, you know, you're not listening to the music. Somebody who, who listens to Torah and does not hear it as a system of changing their personality, is tragically mistaken. Are there many people who do that? Yes, indeed. In fact, this became such a serious problem 200 years ago that the Muslim movement began. Until then, people studied Torah. It was obvious that you needed to practice what you learned. Now, Israel Salanta came along and he said, not working anymore. People are learning Torah in great depth, and they're not allowing it to affect their characters. And so he instituted the practice of actually studying that. So the answer to your question is, Torah does not automatically change you. It does not automatically change you. You want a very, I'll give you a very crude example. If you know anything about martial arts, martial arts, the great martial artists in the world, the history, if you study the history of karate, for example, you know that it's always been conceived by the great masters as a way of developing character. In fact, the highest value they see is self-control. So imagine somebody who studies martial arts and he goes around beating up people. Right, showing how good he is and, and be, be, he got, he's got it wrong. He's just, he's, he's prostituting the art. And somebody who studies Torah and they, 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 they gain the wisdom of Torah and it's not affecting their personality. That person's a ridiculous distortion of what Torah should be. Unfortunately, it's very common. I would point out to you, by the way, that a person who's not an exemplary character and learns Torah is probably still better off than somebody who doesn't. Because at least that person's not committing murder and adultery and you know, their, their, their standards of honesty might not, not be ideal. They might take advantage of people in business. They might, uh, you know, they may have rough edges to their character. They still probably be a lot better than a person with no values at all. But, uh, but it's not the point. It's not the point. And therefore, Torah needs to be taught in a way and by people who have achieved some level of objective character development. That should be obvious. It's a great sadness and tragedy that it's not the case today. Anyway, next question. Is bungee jump allowed is bungee jumping allowed <laughs> you know um, do you know about the man who went on a very tall building very very tall building and he tied two canaries to his shoulders Zev do you know this one actually this is a fundamental story but they wouldn't know that he ties two canaries to his shoulders actually to his, the, the, the things on his safari suit, Zev, ties into his shoulders, jumps off the Colton Center and smacks into the cement at the bottom. Gets up and he says, gee, man, this bungee jumping is just not what it's cracked up to be, man. Anyway, the point is, is bungee jumping allowed? So the answer to your question is this. You are not allowed to do things that are dangerous, okay? A Jew, a Jew is not allowed to do things that are dangerous. 
you are allowed to do things that are normal. Normal. Driving a car has certain dangers, but it's normal. You can do it. Scheduled airline travel, it's normal. Eating food with additives and colorants and preservatives, even though speaking medically, I always feel a little strange about that. It's allowed in Judaism. Why? It's normal. You don't have to worry about what's normal. Okay? That is clear. I wrote a book about that. Here, I'll show it to you. Why not promote my own book? There's a whole book I wrote about that for doctors, Dangerous Disease and Dangerous Therapy. It goes into a whole discussion of what kinds of risks are allowed. Now, if you want to do something that's more than normal, not normal, jumping off a cliff with a rubber rope attached to your ankle on a Sunday afternoon is not normal. Normal means that most people in society do it. So listen carefully. To do things like that, the halakha is you may, but you need a good reason. You may, but you need a good reason. The classic good reason is earning a living. So let's get this clear. Let's say you want to do something that is more dangerous than normal. Okay? I'm not talking about very dangerous. If it's very dangerous, you're definitely not allowed to do it. Probably not even to save someone's life. That's another discussion. I'm talking about things that are slightly more dangerous than normal. The Talmud says, you can do it if you have a reason. The best reason is, the normal reason, earning a living. The Talmud gives an example of people picking fruit on the branches of very high trees where there's some danger of falling. The Gemara says, if you're doing it as an amateur, not allowed. Doing it to earn a living, it's allowed. The Torah allows you to do things that have a moderate danger when you have a good reason. Good reason means earning a living, ability to get married, living in a normal social environment. You're allowed to do it. Now, if you, now, now, first question to ask about bungee jumping. How safe is it and how dangerous is it? The fact that its perception may be dangerous is not the point. I would guess if you measure the fatalities of bungee jumping, I would guess that probably one in many thousands die. I would guess. I don't know the figures. I'd be very surprised if it's more than one in 10,000 jumps. Probably. I would, I would guess. That's very safe. But it's not normal. And therefore, to go bungee jumping, you need a good reason. For example, it's the only way you can earn a living. Uh, it's not for a Jewish boy to earn a living that way, by the way. But, but, but let's say it's the only way you can earn a living. Maybe. Let's say you're bungee jumping to raise an enormous amount of charity. Maybe. Maybe. But to do that for no reason, not. Parachuting. Parachuting. You know, they say if you parachute and, for the, and, and um, on your first try it, it, it doesn't work, then parachuting is probably not for you. Uh, yeah, but, but anyway, be that as it may. Um, if you Parachuting probably, one in many thousands probably die which means it's very safe, but it's not normal. And therefore, if you're an instructor and you earn a living doing it, maybe. More realistic questions are, are you allowed to ride a motorcycle? Now, riding a motorcycle is normal, but not, not most people do it. In other words, it's perfectly acceptable in society as a normal activity, but it's not that most people do it. Speaking as a doctor, the injuries you see on motorcycle accidents are just so horrendous, so horrific that, you know, that has to be taken extremely seriously. My personal halachic opinion is, under certain circumstances, if you need to ride a motorcycle to earn a living, probably. If you're doing it not to earn a living, probably not. Let me finish with this. There's a classic question was put to Rav Moshe Feinstein. They asked him, is allowed to be a professional ball player? <clears throat> football, American football. Zev, this is not for you. This, uh... <clears throat> you know, Zev, it's the game that those wimps play with all the padding and all that, right? Not like, not like real men who play rugby. But anyway, um, American football, there is a risk of getting a broken neck in a tackle or breaking someone's neck. There have been catastrophic injuries. Ramosha Feinstein writes, if you're doing it professionally, probably acceptable. Earning a living, the danger is known. The danger of getting injured or injuring someone else, the other person is also participating willingly. If it's done to earn a living, probably. Um, the famous question was a Nodi Yehuda in the 1700s. A Jew asked him a question, I'm a big game hunter. I go out into the wilds and I trap wild animals. That's how I earn a living. Is that allowed for me as a Jew? By the way, I want to tell you today, the Kruger National Park or any place like that, probably the safest place to be. It's the cities today that are dangerous. But anyway, be that as it may, in his day, going out into the wilds was dangerous. You know, the answer is a fascinating answer. He says, first of all, being a hunter is not a Jewish profession. It's an Aesop profession, right? A Jew doesn't, we don't hunt animals, especially with the cruelty and so forth and so on, we don't do that. But from a lucky point of view, if you earn a living doing it, okay. 
doing it because you feel like it, danger not acceptable. Going into a dangerous situation, somewhat dangerous because you're earning a living, yes. So final answer, bungee jumping, if it's very safe objectively and you have an excellent reason, maybe. For fun on a Sunday afternoon, no. I, I say a little to Hilliman, go, go learn. Yeah, next question. The next question um, is actually two, two different questions, both sort of related, um, somewhat connected. How can one be happy with his lot? Meaning, how can I get this to enter my heart and not just be in my mind? Okay, that's a great question. The question of being happy with your lot, that means you have a certain amount, maybe limited. Maybe you'd like more money and more facilities, you don't have it. And we have an ideal of being happy with what you have. How do you do that? Let me say two things here. Um, this might surprise you. Number one is, if you need more, it's allowed to strive for more. You know, if you, if you feel you have a need for certain, you need a certain amount of space, a home that has a certain amount of comfort or certain kind of food or certain type of clothing, you know, you have to know what your level is to force yourself into a level that you're not ready for. Maybe unwise, maybe unwise. If you make more effort to earn more money, will you earn more money? Isn't it predetermined at Rosh Hashanah anyway? It is largely, but you can increase the blessing. You can increase the blessing. And if it's a genuine need, Hashem will give you that as well. So the first point I'd like to make in answer is not to force yourself into some unrealistic level. You don't have to live in poverty and discomfort, in threadbare clothing, you know, in, a common, in circumstances that make you miserable because you think it's a religious thing to do. No. When you're forced into that, then it's a question of maturity, of adjusting to what you have. And the second answer, the second element to answer to your question, this is something you cannot fake. The question says, how can I get this into my heart and not just in my mind? You can't fake it. When you reach a level of maturity through your own spiritual development, your own work, your own work on not focusing on yourself so much, giving to other people, working hard with other people, appreciating the lacks that they have, trying to help other people with their deficiencies. As you mature and become a genuinely bigger person, this falls into place automatically. It's not a thing you can sit back and say, I am going to tell myself, it's like you cannot build emunah and bitachon because you decide to do it and simply focus on it and it happens. It takes years of practice. It takes small steps. Okay, it takes small steps. For example, happy with your lot. So you have a financial issue and you want to buy something. It's a financial strain. It's a small thing. Think about it carefully. Do you really need that? Do you really need it? Something small, not a big thing, a small thing. Can you do without it? See if you can do without it and be happy. I'm not talking about being hungry and being miserable or cold. I'm talking about something that's a bit of a luxury and you can train yourself small steps at a time. I think that's the beginning of, of the uh, answer to your question, but it's something that cannot be forced and should not be focused on to a dysfunctional degree. Let me put it in, in, in most general terms that I can. You need to be normal. Before you can be special, you need to be normal. And we live in a culture, some aspects of American culture are not really normal. It's an American dream situation that's projected and presented as essentially so often, you know, way beyond what's necessary. First one needs to be normal. From there, you can start developing. Yes, any other questions? So another question over here is, um, if someone struggles with the over the... Oh, we're getting some background noise. Hold on, let me see. Something's wrong here. Hold on, yeah. see. Can you maybe mute that person? Then it'll be easier. Yeah, everyone is supposed to, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The um, question is, if, um, if someone struggles with being overly emotional and sensitive, how does the Torah teach us to work on this or overcome this? You know, I think it's a very similar answer. Let, 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 me, let me begin by answering this. A person needs to know that your disadvantage and problem in life is always your advantage. Your problem is always your gift. If you're emotionally sensitive, that's terrible. You'll be very easily hurt. But it's an incredibly useful tool when you're building a relationship, when you're building a marriage or a relationship with your child, or you're a therapist, or you need to use your emotions. That's a wonderful tool. The person who is very thick-skinned and feels nothing, that's wonderful. It will keep them out of certain emotional pain. But it's going to be a big problem when they're trying to bond. So the first thing to register is your gift is always your problem. Your problem is always your gift. If you're quick to respond, right? You've quick, you, you respond immediately. That's fantastic. You'll save life when, when other people are, you know, stunned and not know what to do. 
On the other hand, you'll say an angry word before you control it. Your advantage is always your problem. So the first thing for your questioner to know is, if you have a very, very sensitive and emotional personality, first thing is it's excellent. Now the question is control it. Okay, how do you do that? You need to read, read its situation carefully. Is this a situation where I allow myself to emote and bond or where I need to put a defense around myself? The ideal Jewish person, the ideal Jewish child is a child raised with tremendous inner sensitivity, tremendous vulnerability, loving, peaceful, giving, totally sincere, uh, open honesty, inwardly, with a family, in a marriage. But outside relationships, a very shrewd, exterior otherwise you'll be eaten alive they used to use the image of the cactus you know the sabra the sabra is very very sweet inside but it's got spines on the outside a jewish child needs to be raised to know that you have a sensitive loving totally unjudgmental when it comes to the close relationship of a marriage parent child relationship total open trust outside of that cautious cautious defense you know here's an amazing thing you look at a Torah personality, the great rabbis, unbelievable, incredible cosmic feeling of love for other Jews, unbelievable sensitivity, and very shrewd where appropriate. Very shrewd. The Torah, you notice when you, when you, you learn Torah, you see it deals with the unbelievable depth of love and giving. And the Torah itself teaches you all the perversions and all the difficulties and all the dishonesties and all the distorted things in the world. You know, uh, you know somebody once said to me, how do you raise your child in a religious world? They were talking when we lived in Israel. You live in an isolated, sealed community. Your children see only the religious. When your kids get out into the real world, whoa, they're going to be so shocked. The first time your kid goes to a newsstand and they see an improper magazine or something in the world, they're going to, be, they're going to explode. Right? Your kids are isolated like little angels. When they hit the real world with all its distortion and violence, incredible violence and all its prurient exposure of things, your kids are going to fall apart. Now the answer to that question is exactly the opposite. The child in a religious world has been exposed to every perversion you can imagine because the Torah talks about them all. The Torah, I challenge you, show me one, don't show me, but you know, just theorize. Can you think of one book that is distorted, pornographic, violent, etc., that mentions every possible human perversion? The Torah does. So when you read through the text of the Torah, here's this little child, they've grown up in the religious world. Of course it's done in a refined and dignified fashion. Okay, when they're a little child of six years old, you can't, you say you're not allowed to marry an animal. You, you have to do, use the right terminology. You can't, you can't use graphic images that a child's not ready for. But, but as they mature, I've always been amazed. You walk into yeshiva, it's 14 year old Jewish boys. They're learning Talmudic sections, which are so intimate, things you couldn't even talk about in public, no way. Right, never mind what the Torah says, what the Gemara says. They're going into the hairy details of things that are so intimate. And they're studying it with a purity of Torah. Unbelievable thing. So this, this child raised in the Torah world, right, when they get out into the real world, of course they'll be shocked and horrified to see how distorted it is. But there's nothing, you know, but it's the second child who never had that education. He's the kid who gets out to a street corner and someone shows him a picture and stuff that he never dreamed of, right? He hasn't, he's, not, he, he's, not, he's not the one who's prepared for it. And therefore, at age-appropriate stages, the Torah talks about all, the, it, the Torah isn't a syrupy, you know, do goody goody thing. The Torah is full of every illicit pleasure, every perversion, every distortion the world can throw at you. And kids deal with that. They deal with it. A Torah personality knows the good side and knows the bad side. You know, the Chazanish, the Chazanish once had to deal with a certain Israeli politician. It was a very difficult time in Israeli history. They were trying to put girls in the army. It was a very hard time. And there was one politician who was completely opposed to the religious world, you know, from a very, coming from a very bad place. And the Chazanish had to send a message to this man. So he said to the messenger, listen, go and meet that politician and tell him, gave him a message. And he said, by the way, don't take your normal route. He said, take certain back alleys. Don't ask me why, just do it. Don't take the normal route. Take certain back alleys. And he, and he directed him through the, the, a, a, a strange the fellow took that route, and who did he meet on one of those dark back alleys? The politician who he was going to find, who was trying to avoid him by taking that route. The Chassanish knew that the man would be devious, and he even knew which devious route he would take. Being a Torah mind doesn't mean that you're naive. It means you're pure and beautiful, and you understand the world of the distorted as well. Anyway, 
the answer to the question is a sensitive and kind and wonderful personality, great, in the right place. But it needs a shrewd defense on the outside. Bottom line, to be a Torah personality, you need to know your personality and know where it should be allowed to express itself correctly and where it needs to be controlled. Can I take another minute, Rabbi Rittenberg? No. Yes. Only five minutes for each question, right? But listen, I'll give you one beautiful example. Here's a classic. You know, when the Jewish people made the golden calf, the women did not participate. The women, the ladies, they were on a much higher spiritual level. They were not tempted. They did not participate. They refused to give their gold. The men forced them. The men took the gold from the ladies by force and they built a golden calf. God rewarded the Jewish women. You know what he did? He gave them a, a gift called Rosh Chodesh. He gave them a special festival, unique only to women, Rosh Chodesh. But the mystery is he didn't give it to them immediately. He gave it to them later when the Mishkan was built. When the sanctuary, the Mishkan was built in the desert, that's when he gave women the gift of Rosh Chodesh. And the question is, why? They did a good deed. Why do you wait to give the reward? Listen to this. The answer is beautiful. This, is, this has been said by Rav Mordechai Miller. He said this, when the Jewish ladies did not give their gold to the golden calf, why didn't they give their gold? Either because they're righteous or because they like their jewelry, maybe. You don't know. But later, when the, when the Mishkan was built and the ladies gave their gold, oh, then you see, oh, but maybe they gave their gold to the Mishkan because they give to anything. They feeble-minded people who just give to anything. Oh, they didn't give to the golden calf. You see, whichever quality you accuse them of, the other one proves. If you say ladies are stingy, they like their jewelry, they won't give to any cause. No, they gave to the Mishkan. And if you say, well, they don't think they give to anything. No, they didn't give to the golden calf. You see, each one shows that the other one was under control. So I don't care which their quality was, whichever one it was, the other event proves that it was under control in the right place. And therefore, the formula for personal success is know your character, let it come out fully where it's appropriate, and put the brakes on where it's not. Next question. Okay, we have a, qu a few different questions regarding uh, veg vegetarianism, or vegan. Um, whether this is an optimal lifestyle according to Jewish law, whether it's even allowed. Um, somebody was asking if possibly at the time of Mashiach will we'll be vegetarian, um, possibly the Rev. Cook was a vegan. So can you give us your insights on this whole uh, question? Okay, the question is about vegetarianism and veganism. First of all, those are two very different things, let me point out. Vegetarianism is a range of dietary practices Veganism in its modern form is an extreme, an extreme uh, refusal, refusal to use any animal products. It isn't only eating. These people won't wear leather shoes or leather belts or use wool or uh, you know, any animal product at all. That's quite an extreme. But let's talk about vegetarianism and, and, and simple veganism for the meantime. I'll give you a short answer and a bit of background. The short answer is it's acceptable. A person wants to be vegetarian, it's fine. But they may not say that eating meat is wrong. Can't say that. If Hashem allows it, it's fine. You don't like it. It makes you feel unhealthy and, and, and full and bloated and it doesn't agree with you. And uh, you're sensitive about killing animals. You don't like the idea. That's fine. That's cool. But you can't say it's wrong. You can't say God made a mistake when he allowed us to eat meat. That, that's completely out of order. It's true that in the Messianic era, when the world was formed originally, it was a vegetarian world. Adam certainly did not eat meat. The Torah goes so far as to say that killing an animal is spilling blood. It's a very serious thing to do. And therefore, another way the Talmud puts it is you need to be wise to eat meat. And so it's not a simple matter at all. And therefore, and therefore, are there health benefits to being vegetarian? Yes. Are there health complications? Yes. Speaking medically, if you are a strict vegetarian, you will miss certain vitamins and elements that you need. If you're a very strict vegetarian, which means no eggs and no... Um, no eggs and no fish uh, and no meat products at all, particularly if you drink no milk as well, you'll, you'll miss certain essential um, amino acids. You can make them up through legumes and nuts, but you need to know what you're doing. It's not simple. You'll also miss certain vitamins and trace elements and minerals. Can you make them up? Yes, indeed. I would say, speaking as a doctor, if you're going to be a strict vegetarian, you should do two things. One is make very sure you know the balance of amino acids so you don't, you don't lose those in your protein. And probably a good idea to take a multivitamin to cover the basis of the things you're probably not getting. Whether you like it or not, our digestive system is adapted for eating meat. 
Can you do it without that? Yes, but you need to know what you're doing. However, however, there is also an idea brought in Hasidic sources that when you eat meat, you elevate the meat. I'll just tell you the way it's put in these sources. The inanimate world is absorbed by the plant world. The plant world is absorbed by the animal world. The animal world absorbed by the human. And that's a tremendous aliyah. You raise the whole system into the quality of the human. Which means if you eat meat and do a mitzvah, you have raised the chemicals into the plant, into the animal, into you, and all that becomes mitzvah activity. Nothing better could happen to a chicken, listen to me, nothing better could happen to a chicken than by eaten by a tzaddik. Because the chicken gets transformed into mitzvah activity. That's amazing for a chicken. And nothing worse could happen to a chicken than getting killed to be eaten by somebody who just goes to sleep or does bad stuff with it. That's a disaster for a chicken. Every, believe me, every chicken prays to be eaten by a big tzaddik because then it gets transformed into spiritual energy. Also, killing of animals has to be done by the neck. That's a very special separation of the high and the lower worlds. There's a lot of Kabbalistic teaching in this. And therefore, if you eat meat correctly, not just because you feel like it, you've got to eat the meat with appreciation of what it is and then do mitzvahs. That is a tikkun for the, for the meat. So in the Messianic era, yes, we will not eat animals. Animals will not te- tear each other apart. If you've ever seen that happen, it's a very, very brutal and, and shaking thing to see. That is not the way the world was designed. We'll go back to eating plant material. In the meantime, it's allowed to eat meat. It has to be done carefully with great wisdom. But um, eventually, we'll, we'll transcend that level. Yeah, any other questions? By the way, veganism, which means not using the animal world at all, that's not correct. At the moment, the animal world is created for us to use, not with unkindness, no suffering to animals, but it's a great merit. We're allowed to use animals for human benefit as long as you don't cause them suffering. Why not? It's a privilege for them to be used in that fashion. And uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, all right, Taz, thank you so much. I have a, a few other questions. Um, so... A few different questions regarding the role of women in Judaism. Um, so, one question was: um, a person writes, "My base Yaakov education taught that women are meant to have their husbands make decisions on their behalf of the family." This infuriates me. Please clarify the Torah view. Okay, so let me repeat that. Beis Yaakov education taught this lady that her husband should make the decisions for the family. First of all, she should get her money back from the Beis Yaakov. That's the first step, because they taught her wrong. Secondly, she should tell me the name and address of the lady who ran that Beis Yaakov. I've got a few friends I'd like to send around on a dark night to, uh, to, deal, with that, to deal with that lady. That's just a Jewish education. Let me, let me correct it. The way family decisions should be made is by consensus. By consensus. By the way, if that lady's infuriated, she needs therapy. She needs help because being infuriated by something in a family relationship is going to not be good for anybody. So she needs discussion with her husband and come to a workable solution. And if not, the family might need some sort of therapy or a rabbi to mediate. You don't want to be, live your life infuriated with something that's wrong. But I'll tell you the right way to make family decisions. And I hope your question is listening to this. First of all, you make decisions by consensus. Family decisions are made by the family. However, what if you cannot reach agreement? Let's say you can't reach agreement. There's a difference in husband and wife. What should you do? So listen to me carefully. First of all, there are practical steps you can take. Every Jewish married couple should have a rabbi. A rabbi they both like and trust, who knows them, understands them individually, and understands the reality of their situation and their family situation. And when a question arises, that's a lucky question. For example, standards of kashrut, argument about them, or one of them wants to eat in their parents' home, the other one thinks it's not kosher enough, okay? Or what kind of food the children should, all sorts of halachic questions. You go to the rabbi, you both trust the rabbi, he makes the decision for you, and then it's cool. No arguments, no tensions, that was the deal, okay? You, of course, you choose a rabbi you're gonna accept. Gotta be somebody you both look up to. Every married couple should accept a rabbi like that. It takes the heat out of many, many family decisions. Secondly, if you can't do that and you cannot reach agreement, so the halacha is that in certain circumstances, the husband makes a final decision. And in certain circumstances, the wife makes the final decision, right? It's not that the husband makes all the family decisions. Certain things fall to the husband at the end of the day and certain things fall to the wife at the end of the day. Which things fall to the husband? 
generally what's called Mili Dishmaya. Mili Dishmaya means religious, halakhic things, except for the woman's halakhic area. So when it comes to things dealing with Torah learning, for example, the man makes the final decision. If it's the woman's halakhic area, the kitchen, kashrut, anything to do with food, that is her area. He's got no opinion about that. He does not interfere. That's her business. When it comes to marital law, Jewish marriage, intimate marital law, that's the wife's area. No interference. <coughs> you marry this lady, you trust her. And what she says is good. End of discussion. When it comes to practical matters, it's the wife's decision, what's called mili da'ara. Anything practical, she makes the final decisions. She wants green walls with yellow spots. You love it. Got no opinion about that. Anything practical, she's got the sense she makes the decisions. And therefore, there's division of authority. It's a wonderful way to, to uh, remove the tension from a marriage. Each one has their own area of expertise, and they are the dominant decision maker in that area. And uh, this lady should go back to Beis Yaakov and tell him that. Next question. Question is regarding prayer, regarding tefillah. Why does Hashem ask us to praise him before we request in prayer if he does not gain from our praise? Okay, the answer is the question. It's because he doesn't gain. Obviously, it's for us. When you approach a king, you need the proper, you know, I live in England now. If you're lucky enough, if you have an audience of the queen, they train you in how you have to speak to her. You know that? They take you before you go into the queen and they tell you how to address her. You have to say your majesty, and after that you say ma'am. Then you've got a bow, and a lady's got a curtsy. Before you speak to a king or a queen, there's a protocol. And therefore, Hashem is teaching you, it's actually not Hashem who teaches you this, it's the rabbis, but the rabbis teach you that when you approach Hashem, there's a certain way to do it. What's called Derech Eretz. The way you approach Him is, first of all, with praise, recognizing who He is, talking about His greatness, and when you've done, you say thank you. This is the way you relate to a king. Right? And therefore, it's not because he needs it, it's because he doesn't need it. You need it. And therefore, when you're approaching him, first you need to build in yourself an awareness of who you're speaking to, and then you take leave in an appropriate fashion. I'll give you an example. When a parent teaches a child to say please and thank you, are you doing it because you need it? If you need the child to praise you and say please and thank you and look up to you and respect you, if you need it, you're a very dangerous parent. You got, you're not ready to be a parent yet. But if you teach your child to deal correctly and respectfully with you, because they need to know how to do that, then you're an excellent parent. You're not doing it because you need it. You're doing it because the child needs to learn politeness and good manners and derech eretz. Right? And therefore, obviously, God is not a, um, you know, an emotionally needy being who needs us to praise him, obviously. The, the, the correct way to approach a king is with appreciation of who he is. And you speak about that. You bring it out. Then you make your requests which is appropriate, and then you step back in respectful fashion. So it's a love, fear, or an awe, respect situation, and you're simply developing in your mind, and you'll practice the right way to handle that situation. We have um, two questions related to experimental medical treatment. I guess one question is, what is the Torah view on experimental medical treatments? And the second is, and using animals for um, testing on animals. Let's start with animals because we dealt with that before. The principle is we are allowed to use animals for human benefit, but we're not allowed to cause them to suffer. You can cause an animal to work. There's no Torah prohibition of riding an animal, a horse, or having a donkey or an ox work for you. Again, you're not causing it to suffer. You're causing it to work for you. That's okay. It can bear a burden for you, right? You can teach a dog to guard you and to do whatever it does, that's okay. Cause them suffering, no. And therefore, when you need experimentation and you're going to cause the animals to suffer, that's wrong and it's unnecessary. In an extreme example, where there's a life at stake, a human life at stake, and you might have to do something to an animal to save a human life, possibly, possibly. But as a policy, we should absolutely not be cause animals to, to suffer. If you'd like to know a source for that, Rav Asher Weiss in his halachic work, he lists no less than 11. 11 Torah sources to show you, right, what, are, what is the source of what's called Tzar Balei which is unique, by the way, it doesn't apply to humans. It's a specific prohibition of cruelty to animals. So no, you cannot use animals for research uh, if it's going to in any way be cruel. Not only research, by the way. Animals shouldn't be treated in any way cruel, even for, for food or for eggs or for milk. It's just ridiculous that, right, what, what people do to animals. It's, uh, don't blame people who, 
desist from using those products when you see some of the ridiculous cruelty that is foisted on animals. Um, the second question is experimental treatment. Uh, doing experiments, uh, participating in experimental trials and so forth. The first important thing to know, it's not necessary. It's not necessary. There's no obligation to go out and find a new therapy and expose people to danger. Not necessary. The, the, um, it's a wonderful thing to do and a great credit to mankind and to researchers who do it. But it's not necessary. What's necessary is to use accepted, conventional, approved medical treatments. From there on, God takes care of you. Again, if you do less than the best, negligent. More is a lack of bitochen. Therefore, there's no halachic obligation to start inventing new treatments. Is it meritorious? Yes. Is it allowed? Yes. Is it, should communities be spending money on research in those things? Absolutely, yes. But it doesn't mean you have to rush out now and join a clinical trial for some new treatment that, that, uh, that has just been thought up. Under what standards can you use an experimental treatment? First of all, research. Can you expose yourself to risk in a research trial? So I have a chapter on that in this book, by the way, a whole chapter going through all the criteria. In order to join, to run a research trial, and let's say today there's a lot of research being done for COVID using convalescent plasma. You probably know that the Orthodox world has been at the forefront of donating their plasma to save lives. Okay, it's been richly featured on television and the radio. Big credit to us that many hundreds or even thousands of Orthodox people are coming forward to give their blood to help other people get a chance of survival. By the way, I'll just point out to you, speaking medically, convalescent plasma has not yet been demonstrated to be effective. It may turn out to be. We don't know. At this point in time, it's still experimental. But every reason to, to, to follow those experiments and, and see where they lead, by, by all means. But to run a research trial, there are many criteria that you need. One is it has to be judged to be safe, just to put people at risk, high risk, where there's no idea this is going to be effective, not acceptable. Secondly, there has to be consent. The people participating in the trial have to know the risk they're getting into and take it on voluntarily. Thirdly, the trial should compare the treatment that's being experimented on with the best alternative treatment, not no treatment. Again, this is an important point. You, if you've got a new drug, let's say you want to try hydroxychloroquine for COVID. Let's say you want to try that. So then the right comparison is not trust the drug against nothing. The right comparison is test the drug against the best alternatives that we have. Okay, that's the important point. And that's made in, in academic studies as well. And there's a list of criteria you need. There has to be reasonable expectation that there'll be benefits from this, reasonable expectation that it will not be risky. Any research subjects must be free to leave the trial at any point they want. There's got to be full disclosure of all the information. There are a lot of criteria. And if you meet those criteria, you could run a study. Are people allowed to take a certain calculated risk for such a benefit? Yes. It fits into one of those things I said before. That is good reason. One is allowed to do that. Finally, experimental treatment. You're very ill. There's a new treatment that's available. Not known if it helps. Are you allowed to try it out? First point is it's not necessary. Let me say that again. It's not necessary. No matter how desperate the illness it's not the experimental treatment that cures you. It's God. And therefore, all you're required to do is the best available standard agreed by a consensus of experts. Less than that is negligent. You're taking chances with your life. But more than that is unnecessary. You don't have to run around grasping at straws and doing every possible alternative, you know, thing because it's out there. And if you do, by the way, there's no limit to that. However, in desperate circumstances, if a consensus of experts agree that this new treatment is reasonable, that means there's no hope. The person looks like they're dying. They're very ill. We've got some newfangled treatment that has got logic behind it, that experts agree is a reasonable thing to do. Then it's allowed. Absolutely. Yes. Should it be done? Probably. If there's no other, no other hope in those circumstances and it's reasonable, then the Torah allows such treatment. But the attitude I'm trying to get across is one should not be grasping at every straw, trying to do every possible suggested alternative not just because some president or others says he's taking it, that does not mean that it's validated medically. Right? You need good evidence, calm, collected studies, it takes time, and that is what's required medically. Uh, yes, any other questions? All right, Tess, um, thank you so much. Um, I hope, as Dr. Shem, you will consider continuing this sometime in the near future. And on behalf of all of us who listen to this live, as well as the recordings, um, thank you very much for making this possible. And um, 
hopefully we'll be able to uh, get more pearls of your wisdom in the, in the coming, coming weeks. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi Rittenberg. Thanks, uh, Rabbi Khan, Daniel, everyone out there, Jerry, uh, Elina Tan, and uh, Eitan, all my friends. Thank you for joining this. Um, been a pleasure uh, going through these sessions. I can't continue, Rabbi I've already told you everything I know. <laughs> thank you, Rabbi. Hazaka <laughs> Baruch. Uh, thank you very much. All the best to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi, Ta Rabbi Tatz, Rabbi Khan mentioned about a different topic that maybe you would give a class on, on about your background, your story. Personal stories. Yeah, maybe Rabbi Khan and myself will, will sit and uh, uh, trade stories about our background. That'll be, I'll show you some photographs <laughs> of myself on my motorcycle. Oh, and, uh, oh. And doing, I'll even maybe if you, you're really nice to me, I'll show you a picture of myself doing martial arts. And that wow! Kind of, that, yeah, I'm going to have to get a bigger Zoom account for that. Yeah, it okay. should be on your website. Well, I don't want to get too popular. <laughs> okay, I'll think about that. Thank you very right, much. Yeah, I'll be in touch. Okay, it's so nice to see you. Okay, so all the best. Thanks, eh? Yeah, bye bye. <laughs>